Okay, this is a read-through of the new starter set from Dungeons & Dragons called the Dragons of Stormwreck Isle. And we're on to Chapter 2 at this point. And just to uh, make sure I state this again, this will contain spoilers because I'm literally reading the entire book. So obviously, if you plan to play this as a player, uh, you should not be watching, listening to any of these videos. But I thought that people around the world who don't have access to this material might find it interesting to get a chance to know what this adventure is all about. I'm not a professional YouTuber, so the quality is not going to be the greatest, and I am not a voice actor, so I will occasionally stumble over some of the words, have to go back and reread a line, and I'm sure there will be mispronunciations because, uh, you know, these fantasy names are sometimes challenging to to pronounce. With all that out of the way, let's go ahead and move on to chapter 2, Sea Growl Caves. This chapter assumes the characters come here before going to the wreck of Compass Rose, and they are still first level. It also includes simple instructions to scale up the danger in combat encounters if the characters complete chapter 3, Cursed Shipwreck, before coming here and are now second level. Caves Overview the sea caves on the southwest side of Stormwreck Isle are inhabited by an unusual colony of myconids, fungus people who normally live deep underground. Though they can't abide though they can't abide sunlight, these myconids used to welcome visitors now and then. In particular, they traded with Tarek from Dragon's Rest, giving him rare fungi that grow in their caves in exchange for food scraps and other waste from the cloister, which nourished the fungi in the caves. Recently, though, the myconids have rejected Tarek's visit and placed a monstrous guardian at the entrance to their caves that keeps all visitors away. The reason for this sudden shift in myconids' behavior is that a blight has spread through the caves and is poisoning the myconids, twisting, twisting their gardens and even laying low their leader, Senensa. The source, the source of the blight is the tomb of the red dragon Sheriff deep beneath the island. Noxious fumes from the dragon's tomb normally filter up through the rock and vent to the surface through a cavern at the back of Seagrow Caves. Let me reread that. Noxious fumes from the dragon's tomb normally filter up through the rock vent to the surface through a cavern at the back of Seagrow Caves that the myconids avoid, but the vent has become blocked and the fumes have spilled into the myconids' caves. Besides this insidious poison, visitors to Seagrow Caves must face one additional threat, the sturges that nest in the caves. These blood-sucking monsters aren't much of a threat individually and don't bother the bloodless myconids, but they can be deadly in large numbers. Seagrow Cave Features The caves have the following features. Ceilings. Unless noted otherwise, the ceilings in the caverns are 20 feet high and the tunnels connecting the caverns are 15 feet wide. Light. The interior caves are illuminated by bioluminescent fungi, which provide dim light throughout the area. See vision in the rulebook. Walls. The cave walls are formed from hexagonal columns of dark gray basalt volcanic rock originating from Sheruth's undersea tomb. The walls, the walls provide hand and footholds, so climbing the walls doesn't require an ability check. Fumes. Toxic volcanic fumes from deep below the island are slowly poisoning the fungi in the caves. A faint smell of sulfur pervades the place, growing stronger the closer one gets to area B6. If the characters take a long rest inside the caves before opening the vent in B6, each character must succeed on a DC-13 constitution saving throw or become poisoned. See conditions in the rulebook. The Lesser Restoration spell ends this effect, as does finishing a long rest in fresh air. Running this chapter. Once the characters decide to visit Seagrow Caves, they have two options for reaching the site. By boat, 
Dragon's Rest has a rowboat the characters can take around the western end of the island. This is Tarek's preferred method. The trip to Seagrow Caves is five miles, which takes about three hours and 20 minutes to row along the coast. Walking around the coast of the island is a little easier than rowing, even though it's farther, because the characters have to walk around the bay, have to walk around the bays instead of rowing across them. The seven mile trip takes only two hours and 20 minutes at a normal walking pace. The characters can choose whether they want to walk on the cliffs high above the sea or pick their way among the tide pools at the base of the cliffs. The lower route is available only at low tide and see the tides table. Approaching at sea level. If the characters arrive at sea growl caves at sea level, read the following text. A cliff of dark gray stone towers 200 feet above the crashing waves, which rush in and out of a yawning cave mouth. A swirling slick of colors dances on the water's surface emanating from the cave. Approaching from above. If the party approaches from, ab from above, read this text. An opening gapes in the cliff face 200 feet below you like a mouth drinking in the crashing waves. Two natural stairways formed of stone columns offer ways down the cliffs. So those are your two ways in. Entering the caves. At high tide, the 40 foot high tunnel area B1 is flooded all the way to area B2. The natural stairways, which are not shown on the map of Seagrow Caves, descend the cliffs into the sea. The characters can either wait for low tide or row or, row or swim into the tunnel. At low tide, a five foot wide pathway is exposed along the, the base of the cliffs and the edge of the tunnel. The tides shift every six hours as summarized in the tides table. So the tides table. So if the time is midnight to sunrise, the tide is low. If the time is sunrise to noon, the tide is high. If the time is noon to sunset, the tide is low. And if the sun, if the tide, if the time ugh, is sunset to midnight, then the su, the tide's high. Interacting with myconids, the myconids' initial attitude toward outsiders is hostile, and it says to see the social interaction in the rulebook. They aren't malicious, though, and they don't resort to violence immediately. Adults use their rapport spores to telepathically warn visitors to leave. See rapport spores below for details about this form of communication. Sprouts flee toward the nearest adults to warn them of intruders. If the characters attack, the myconids defend themselves. To convince a hostile myconid to converse or to allow the characters to do anything other than leave the caves, a character must succeed on a DC 20 charisma check. Depending on the character's approach, the deception, intimi intimidation, or persuasion skill can apply to the check. Mentioning Tarek's name or representing the offering he sent the myconids grants advantage on this check. An indifferent myconid is willing to explain what is going on in Seagrow Caves. The Sprouts know only that their leader, Sinensa, has fallen ill and that a nasty spell pervades their caves. Adult myconids know that the Crystal Cave, Area B6, is the source of the foul odor and that Sinensa fell ill after going into that cave to investigate the issue. The myconids normally avoid that cave because sunlight filters into it by way of the vent at the western end of the cave, and even diffuse sunlight is unpleasant to these cave-dwelling creatures. Rapport Spores A myconid's Rapport Spores ability allows all intelligent creatures in the area to communicate telepathically with each other. The characters and the myconids are effectively speaking thoughts at each other. This effect does not allow any creature to probe invasively into another creature's mind, but it transcends language barriers and you can play around with the kind of communication that the spores allow. Myconid's facial expressions might be difficult to read, but their telepathic 
communication might carry a direct impression, a direct expression of the myconids' emotional state. For example, when the myconids talk about their ailing leader, the characters might feel a deep sadness and a sense of anxiety much more clearly and powerfully than mere words and facial expressions can communicate. The effects of rapport spores last for one hour, so characters might be telepathically linked to each other, whether they're within fifth, uh, whether they're whenever rather they're within 30 feet of each other, even after they leave the cave. Encourage the players to think about how this might affect their characters. Does it make them feel closer to their friends? Does it ease any suspicions they might have about each other? Distress spores. When myconids take damage, they release spores that alert all other myconids within 240 feet of them. All myconids in the cave are in range of each other's distress spores. Myconids in areas B2 and B3 move to area B4 if they detect distress spores. So these areas that we're talking about are here. So this is the entrance to the cave. And depending on the tides could be easier or more difficult to get into. And then here we have, you know, area B2. And they were saying that any myconids in area B2 or B3, if they detect uh, distress spores, they will flee into area B4. Seagrow Cave Locations. The following locations are keyed to map 3, which shows the layout of the Seagrow Caves. B1, Entrance Tunnel. So this is what you read when they arrive in B1. Multicolored fungus covers the walls of this tunnel, its bioluminescent glow filling the cavern with dim light. The surface of the water swirls with colorful, faintly glowing spores, perhaps reacting to the movement of something under the surface. At high tide, this tunnel is flooded, so visitors must approach by boat or swim. At low tide, walkways formed by the tops of stone columns line the sides of the tunnel, leading to a flight of natural steps to Area B2. A spore servant octopus lurks in the water and attacks any creatures other than myconids who enter the tunnel, regardless of the state of the tides. Before the myconid leader lapsed into unconsciousness, it created this guardian to keep outsiders away. Let's take a look at the spore servant octopus. Let's see here. All right, here we are. This is the spore servant octopus. Spore servants are dead creatures reanimated by the magical spores of a myconid leader. The final act of the myconid leader in Seagrow Caves before lapsing into its current comatose state was creating a spore servant from a dead giant octopus to protect the caves while the leader could not. Unlike a living octopus, this guardian has only basic control over its tentacles. Rather than coiling around intruders to immobilize them, the spore servant simply bludgeons them. So the spore servant octopus has an armor class of 11, 52 hit points, or you roll 8d10 and add 8 to generate the hit points for it. Has a speed of 5 and a swim speed of 50. And there are its stats. Condition immunities, blinded, charmed, frightened, paralyzed. Senses, blind sight out to 30 feet, blind beyond this radius, has a passive perception of 8, and it's a challenge rating of 1, so it's pretty tough, um, can be pretty tough for a small party. Hold breath, while out of water, the octopus can hold its breath for one hour. Water breathing, the octopus can breathe only underwater, and its actions are tentacles. Melee weapon attack, plus 5 to hit, reach of 15 feet, one target, and if it hits, it does 7 bludgeoning damage, or you roll 1d8 and add 3 to calculate the damage done. As described on the previous page, the water level here varies by up to 10 feet with the tides. At high tide, the water is about 8 feet deep along the edges of the tunnel and 25 feet deep in the middle. At low tide, the walk waves 
uh, the walkways along the edges are exposed and the water is 15 feet deep in the middle. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, two sturges clinging to the tunnel ceilings are disturbed if fighting breaks out in this area and join the battle. The sturges ignore the spore servant. So let's look at those sturges. Okay, so here we have the sturge. A sturge is a winged pest that feeds on the blood of living creatures through its long proboscis. I don't know what that word is. Proboscis. It uses its proboscis to pierce its victim's flesh while clutching its prey with hooked claws. Let me see. Proboscis. We'll go with that. Proboscis. Armor class is 14. Hit points 2. Or you roll 1d4 to decide, determine how many hit points it's going to have. Speed of 10, flying f 40 feet. Uh, senses dark vision out to 60 feet, has a passive perception of 9. Challenge rating is only 1.8, so not very, not very challenging. Its actions are blood drain. Has a melee weapon attack, plus 5 to hit, 5 foot reach. Hits one creature, does 5 damage upon a hit. Or you roll 1d4 and add 3 to calculate the damage, and it's going to be piercing damage and the Sturge attaches to the target. While attached, the Sturge doesn't attack. Instead, at the start of each of the Sturge's turns, the target loses five hit points or roll 1d4 plus three to calculate how much they lose. The Sturge can detach itself by spending five feet of its movement. It does so after it drains 10 hit points from the target or the target dies. A creature, including the target, can use its action to detach the Sturge. So it's actually quite a bit, I mean, it's a bit more deadly than the challenge rating would suggest because it does like that automatic damage every round. So something to keep in mind. So area B2, the fungus farm, which is uh, right here on the map. So when they enter that area, we want to read this block text. This 50-foot high cavern is a forest of multicolor fungi ranging from tiny filaments to tree-sized mushrooms. A natural staircase of stone columns along the east wall leads up 10 feet to a higher cave area in the north. Water burbles down from that upper cave and collects in a large pool. Two small mushroom-like people are working amid the mushrooms near the pond. A sickening smell like sulfur hangs in the air. The waterfall is fed from a pool in the upper cave, which in turn is supplied by runoff trickling down from the surface. Both pools are five feet deep at most. The two mushroom people are myconid sprouts named Molin and Kraz. They are spreading fertilizer from area B3, while two myconid adults named Hip, hipses and rugaso tend mushrooms near the upper pool out of sight from below. All four myconids, myconids are oblivious to the true threat in the cave, three violet fungi that grow among the harmless mushrooms here. So let's look at those violet fungi. So violet fungus. Violet fungi are giant purplish mushrooms that use root-like feelers to creep across the cavern floors. They use four stalks protruding from their central mass to lash out at prey, rotting flesh with the slightest touch. So they have an armor class of five, 18 hit points, or roll 4d8 to determine how many hit points they have. Speed of five, condition immunities, blinded, deafened, and frightened. Senses, they have a blind sight out to 30 feet. They're blind beyond that radius, per, uh, pa have a passive perception of six, and they are considered a quarter challenge rating, one fourth. False appearance. If violent fungus is motionless at the start of combat, it has advantage on its initiative role. Moreover, if a creature hasn't observed the fungus move or act, the creature must succeed on a DC 18 intelligence investigation check to discern that the violent fungus isn't ordinary fungus. Actions. 
multi-attack. The fungus makes 1d4 rotting touch attacks. So you roll 1d4 and that's how many times they attack. And then the rotting touch is a melee weapon attack, plus 2 to hit with a reach of 10 feet. And it hits one creature, it does 4 necrotic damage, or roll 1d8 to determine how much necrotic damage is dealt. If the characters move into the cave toward the myconids, one violent fungus attacks them, extending long tendrils that cause immediate rot when they touch living flesh. Read this text. As you advance into the cave, a sickly-looking mushroom suddenly stirs to life. It extends long purple tendrils toward you and moves slowly across the cave floor on root-like tendrils, running the combat. Because the violet fungi move so slowly, it's easy for the characters to stay out of their reach and kill the fungus monsters with ranged attacks. The interesting part of this encounter is identifying the danger. One violent, one violet fungus moves and attacks to start the encounter, but the other two remain motionless until characters move close to them. You don't need to keep track of exactly where everyone is standing in the room. Instead, rely on your sense of what's fun and exciting. When a character moves away from an active violet fungus, have other fungus stir and attack that character on the fungus's next turn. If a character scans the fungus farm looking for more violet fungi, cast as much doubt as you can. Many of the fungi look sickly and purple, but pose no danger. Myconids. The myconid sprouts avoid the characters and the myco and the violet fungi. If the adults become aware of danger through the noise of combat or the sprouts' distress spores, they move as quickly as they can to protect the sprouts. If the characters defeat the violet fungi, the myconids' attitudes improve to indifferent, and they are willing to speak to the characters using their rapport spores. The adults agree to accompany the characters and vouch for them with the rest of the myconid colony, improving the other myconids' attitude to indifferent as well. Blighted fungi. A character who examines any of the fungi notices that many of the mushrooms are sickly, shriveled, and blotched with black patches of decay. The blight has no obvious source. Treasure. The fungus farm contains heart cap mushrooms ready for harvest. A character who spends 15 minutes searching this character for useful fungi and succeeds on a DC 12 intelligence nature or wisdom survival check, finds 1d6 of these reddish mushrooms which bear an unsettling resemblance to human hearts. Tarek can make each heart cap mushroom into a potion of healing. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add two violet fungi to this encounter. V3 larder. So when they enter into this area, we would be reading this block text. This cave reeks of rot, and the floor is covered with decaying vegetation. Three small mushroom folk are working amid the filth. In the southwest corner of the cave, a bulbous object the size of a cart clings to the wall and ceiling, glistening like a glob of jelly. Three myconid sprouts named Bip, uh, Bispo, Vallop, and Popple work here gathering fertilizer for use in area B2. The bulbous object is a sturge nest which characters can identify with a successful DC 15 intelligence nature check. If a character moves more than five feet into the chamber, six sturges emerge from the nest and attack. Meanwhile, the sprouts flee toward area B4 at the first sign of intruders, relying on the distraction of the sturges to escape. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add two Sturges to this encounter. Area B4. So let's take a look at that on the map. So that's area B4, so when they enter into that area, either from here or here, this block text would be read. Six clusters of giant mushrooms are arranged in a rough circle around this cavern. Several human-sized mushroom folk stand in a circle in the center of the cave. 
The smell of sulfur is stronger here. Six Myconid adults are here, two of them named Agric and Omphalo are attending to the other four. Craterel, Pleuro, Subrufus, and Verosa are the pronunciations we're going with, who are standing stock still in a dreamlike trance called a meld, experiencing a shared transcendent state. The two conscious Myconids move quickly to confront any intruders who aren't escorted by other Myconids, and they respond with violence to any threat. All six Myconids are ill and fatigued from the blight that is spreading through the caves, so they take turns resting here. And when they enter into this little pocket area up here, we would be reading this next block text. Sinensis Sanctum. Glowing fungus and colorful crystals glow from the walls and ceilings of this smaller cave. In the middle of the cave, two human-sized mushroom folk tend to a larger specimen of their kind. The larger one is shriveled and covered with unhealthy purple blotches, and it does not move. Two myconid adults named Aranta and Enoch are tending the unconscious myconid who leads this colony, Sinensa. The adults collect spores from a barrel-sized glowing red fungus that vaguely resembles a human brain and puff the spores around the leader's head. The treatment is keeping the leader alive for now, but it is a losing battle. Sinensa's only hope is for the blight to end. The adults zealously defend their leader, immediately attacking intruders who aren't accompanied by other myconids. Treasure. If the characters bring the glowing red fungus, called a ruby moral, back to the cloister, Tarek uses it to make them an elixir of health, described in Appendix A. And then finally, Area B6, which is back here. So when they enter into Area B6, the crystal cave, the block text that gets read is, The air in this cave is choked with thick smoke that assaults your nostrils with a pungent odor of brimstone. Strange flickering orange light illuminates the smoke. This area is free of fungal growth. Instead, crystals grow from the rock. To your right, a large cluster of purple crystals juts from the stone. On the far wall, a glowing orange crystal wedged into a fissure in the cave seems to be the source of the light. Streaks of suit of soot trace a path along the cave walls between the purple crystals and the fissure. Two fume drakes lurk amid the sulfurous fumes. So let's look at the fume drakes. I think we've looked at the fume drakes already in the earlier chapter, but let's look at it again. Fume drakes are mischievous creatures that arise from the lingering magical energy of a dead dragon. They resemble small, legless dragons formed from clouds of greenish smoke. They delight in causing pain and confusion in other creatures. So armor class of 12, 22 hit points, or roll 5d6 and add 5 to generate your own hit points. Speed of 30, flight of 30, damage immunities, fire and poison, condition immunities, poison. Uh, dark vision out to 60 feet, passive perception of 10. They speak Draconic and Ignin as their languages. Challenge rating is a quarter or one fourth. Death burst. When the fume drake dies, it explodes in a cloud of noxious fumes. Each creature within five feet of the fume drake must succeed on a DC 11 constitution saving throw or take four poison damage or you roll 1d8 to determine the damage. The actions are a bite. It's a melee attack weapon, plus four to hit with the reach of five, hits one target, does four fire damage, or roll 1d4, add two to determine the damage. Scalding breath, recharge of six. The fume drake exhale, ex exhales a 15-foot cone of scalding steam. Each creature in that area must make a DC 11 dexterity saving throw, taking four fire damage on a failed save, or half as much damage on a successful one, or you roll 1d8 to determine the damage.
These elemental creatures look like little dragons, formed entirely of greenish smoke. They don't leave this cave, but they rush to attack any creature that enters it. This cave is the source of the blight spreading through the Myconid colony. As the characters explore the cave, they can easily determine that noxious fumes from deep beneath the island seep up around the vein of purple crystals. Ordinarily, the fumes vent to the surface through a fissure in the west wall, but the fissure is now blocked by an enormous orange crystal, which is also the source of the light here. The heart of the problem is the tomb of the red dragon Sharuth deep beneath the island. The presence of such powerful of such a powerful dragon far underground causes the volcanic activity that produces the noxious fumes. What's more, the dragon's energy occasionally tears open small rifts in the fabric of reality that lead to the elemental plane of fire, another dimension of reality that is the cosmic source of fiery energy. The plane of fire is the origin of both the orange crystal blocking the vent, which is actually an egg case, and the creatures currently in the cave. Fire crystal. Destroying the orange crystal block, destroying the orange crystal blocking the western fissure allows the noxious fumes to escape the cave and stop the blight that is harming the myconids. A single strong whack with a weapon, a crowbar, or another tool is sufficient to shatter it. When the crystal breaks, a two-foot diameter sphere of smoldering obsidian falls to the floor amid the other pieces and breaks open, releasing a fire snake from this stony egg, seeing the characters only as fuel that attacks them at once. Let's see what the fire crystal is. I mean, it was a bold piece of text, so I assume there's a an object to go along with it. I guess, I guess there's not, but they also mentioned the fire snake. So let's look at that. Fire snakes are the larva from uh, are the larva form of salamanders, powerful creatures from the elemental plane of fire. Intense heat washes off their bodies, and their yellow eyes glow like candles. So they have a 14 armor class, 22 hit points, or roll 5d8 to generate your own. Speed of 30. Damage vulnerabilities, cold. Damage resistances, bludgeoning, piercing, and slashing from non-magical attacks. Damage immunities, fire. They have dark vision out to 60 feet, pa passive perception of 10. They understand ignin, but can't speak it. And they have a challenge rating of 1. Heated body. A creature that touches the snake, or hits it with the melee attack while within five feet of it takes three fire damage or you roll 1d6. Multi-attack. The snake makes one bite attack and one tail attack. On its bite attack, that is considered a melee weapon attack with a plus three to hit and a five foot reach. Hits one target, does three piercing damage plus three fire damage on a hit or you roll 1d4 plus one for the piercing damage and roll 1d6 for the fire damage. The tail attack is a melee weapon attack with a plus three to hit, uh, five foot reach, hits one target, and does three bludgeoning damage plus three fire damage on a hit, or roll 1d4 plus one for the bludgeoning and roll 1d6 for the fire. Breaking the fire crystal also reveals the reason the Myconids avoid this cave. The cave is immediately filled with shimmering sunlight refracted through the crystals that line the vent. Bright light fills the entire area. Treasure. The fire snake's egg breaks into 25 chunks of obsidian worth 25 gold each. Second level characters. If the characters are second level, add a third fume drake to the room when the characters first arrive. Then at the same time the fire snake hatches from its egg two more fume drakes emerge from the cluster of purple crystals. Ending this chapter. If the characters destroy the orange crystal so the toxic fumes can escape the caves, the Myconid's attitudes improve to friendly. Sinensa, the Myconid leader, 
regains consciousness the following morning. If the characters are present when Sinensa awakens, Sinensa gives them the ruby moral from area B5 and permission to keep any other treasure or mushrooms they collected in the caves. Once the characters return to Dragon's Rest, Tarek can use the ruby moral to make an elixir of health described in Appendix A, which he gives to the characters in gratitude for their efforts. Gain a level. After they complete this chapter of the adventure, the characters gain a level. If they visited Sea Growl Caves before the wreck of Compass Rose, they advance from first level to second level. The, the residents of Dragon's Rest urge them to visit the wreck of Compass Rose next. See Shipwreck on page 12. If they've already explored the wreck of Compass Rose in chapter 3, they advanced they advance from second level to third level and are ready to visit Clifftop Observatory in chapter 4. See Lost Wormling on page 13. The chapter the character sheets explain what happens when the characters gain a level. Okay, so that's the end of chapter 2. So we will move on to chapter 3 next.